All right, um, Pastor, you're up if you're ready. Uh oh, and I'm guessing things all over the place. Who's. Uh, Hello, Pastor. Well, welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. Let us start off like we normally do by singing a song to Jesus. I'll do that. Okay. We're going to go a little bit off schedule here. It says children's message first, but we're going to sing a song first. And the words are up here, not in the insert, and I don't know how many verses there are, so. Ha-ha! Wow. Yeah. Three? Somebody wave at me when it's on the last verse. <laughs> tell a story from the Bible, and then we'll try this experiment to get it. Get away, Fussy. So, this story is about someone named Jonah. Well, God came to Jonah, and God said, Jonah, I need you to go to the land of Nineveh and tell everybody there to turn to me and to believe in me, because if they don't, I'm going to destroy all of them. Well, Jonah heard that, and he thought, wait a minute, the people in Nineveh are awful people. They're our enemies. They attack people all the time. I don't want to go there. And so Jonah got in a boat with a bunch of other people, and he sailed far away from Nineveh. But as the boat sailed along, God sent a storm, and it was a terrible storm, and the people on the boat were really scared that they were going to drown. And they tried to save themselves, but nothing worked. And they said, oh, someone must have made God mad. That's why he he's doing this. And Jonah said, it's me. I'm not listening to God. I'm refusing to listen to God. That's why this storm came. And the people still tried to save Jonah, but the storm was just too terrible. And Jonah said, you need to take me and throw me overboard. Well, the people, again, they tried to save themselves, but it just didn't work. And so finally, they took Jonah and whoop, they threw him out of the boat and he splashed down in the water. And as soon as that happened, the storm stopped. But when Jonah was there in the water, a great big fish swam up and went, <laughs> swallowed up Jonah. And when Jonah was in the belly of the big fish, he said, God, I'm sorry. I promise I'm going to listen to you now. I'll go to Nineveh and I'll tell them. And so the fish swam up and blah, threw up Jonah right there on the shore. And Jonah got out, went to Nineveh, and he said, everybody listen to me. God said he's going to destroy you unless you turn to him and believe in him. And that's what every person in Nineveh did. From the king down to the lowliest person, they all listened to God. But when Jonah saw that happen, he was so angry because he didn't like the people in Nineveh. And God said, Jonah, you should be happy these people are saved. But Jonah said, no, I'm mad. 
And that's actually where the story ends. We don't know what happened to Jonah. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try an experiment. We're gonna make a fish, a great big fish. You wanna help? Okay, so we'll do that. All right, so see, we'll make a big fish here. We'll give the fish a mouth. And if you don't get a chance to do this now, we can bring it back there. All right, so here's our fish, right? All right, so take Jonah, all right, and put Jonah right in the mouth of the fish and see what happens. See, it swallows it up. Yeah, so that's our experiment. But we can do this as an experiment when we get back there, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll repeat that for now. Just like <laughs> See, it comes right out again. All right, we'll see. No, you can touch it. See? Yeah, it, it doesn't hurt. It's just, see? It's just, sli it's just uh, slime with mine filings. All right, well, I'll bring it back there so we can all play with it. All right, put it in there. All right, let's put our hands together and we'll pray. And we can play with it when we get back there after church. Oh, God, we thank you so much for this account about Jonah. And help us not to be like Jonah in the beginning. Help us to listen to you no matter what. Because when you tell us something to do, we want to do it because we know you love us and everybody else. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. All right, you go and sit back down. Thank you for being my help. Watch out, Pussy. <laughs> All right, now let's move on to our confession and absolution. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made Amen. heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray for your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. In the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our psalm this morning is from Psalm 16. O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest, and, and does not take pride against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved.
You know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading is from Micah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak king of Moab devised and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shechem to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God or not? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of the Lord. Who believe. 
for Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you for and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And now please join with me as we confess our common faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn now, you may be seated, we turn now to our sermon hymn.
So this morning's question is, have you ever overcome a problem by unorthodox means? So back when I was a substitute kindergarten teacher, I managed to finagle a few classrooms into thinking that out of all the other substitute kindergarten teachers out there, somehow I was the better choice. And so they would call on me whenever they needed somebody. But really, if nothing else, it gave those kindergartners a sense of comfort to know that if their teacher wasn't there, at least I'd be there. I remember one kindergarten in particular that I would re regularly sub for where there was a little boy whose name I don't remember, but I do remember his behavior, which was, to say the least, unorthodox. He frequently had outbursts that made it hard for him, the other students, the teaching assistant, and of course, me. So I liked something for that class, but I admit that I felt the tiniest bit of impending doom any time I had to go there because I knew without a doubt that he would have an outburst, and he did, every time that I went there, have some sort of breakdown. Well, the teacher and the assistant told me they had tried any number of things to make the situation better, but nothing seemed to help. Rewards, punishments, time out, nothing seemed to do anything. And then one day I was called to sub there, and I went there knowing what lay before me. But to my surprise, that little boy had a great morning. No issues at circle time or anything. And when the children went off to play, I went to the assistant and I said, what did you do? And she said it came down to one thing. And she took me over to the computer and showed me something that looked like this. She said that when that little boy, that little boy got to watch a few minutes of the panda cam at the end of every day that he behaved. And it worked, and it kept on working. Both the teacher and the assistant figured that it couldn't last, but it did. Now surely that was an unorthodox solution, but it worked. And when dealing, while dealing with that problem was no doubt vexing, it is nothing compared to the problem that we and everyone else in the world throughout time has been facing and are facing even now. And that is, we are all perishing. And watching pandas, no matter how cute, is never going to solve our dilemma. But for all of the severity and inescapability of our problem, there is a solution. And it is one that has a success rate of 100%. But like the panda, it's an unorthodox one. Or to be more accurate, it is a perfectly orthodox solution, but it is one that no one on earth would ever come up with because it contradicts the way that we normally solve our problems. We're going to be getting our revelations from 1 Corinthians. Paul starts us out right away by showing us that our way is not God's way. He said, for the, word of, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who is being saved, it is the power of God. The problem is the one that I've already mentioned. Some people are perishing, but like many other words, perishing can mean more than one thing. It can refer to physically dying, and that would be a reasonable and basically correct way of understanding what Paul was trying to teach us. People that are not born again are in the process of dying as they are all getting older and approaching the day that they will die, that when their physical bodies will no longer retain their life or spirit. However, the same can be said about us who are saved. We too are getting older and coming nearer to the hour of our death. But there is a vital difference between the saved and the unsaved. When we die, we are going to go on to life as it was always intended to be, a life with God completely unstained by sin. Like Paul said in Philippians, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. However, when the unsaved die, they are not going to go on to life, but to death. Jesus compared the eternal states of these two groups of people. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And yet, the eternal state of these two groups of people doesn't seem to be that all Paul had in mind, because he also said that those who are in the process of perishing also see the cross as folly. But what is the connection between the two? Why would dying make someone scorn the cross? Well, 
We can answer that in two ways. First, the cross is not how most people would solve their problems. Being saved from death through another person dying on a torturous instrument of death could be said to be the most unorthodox of all solutions. Many see the cross not just as illogical, but offensive. Because indeed, some people call the process of Jesus dying on the cross cosmic child abuse. And without the revelation of God, they may even have a point. But that leads us into the other aspect of perishing, and that is that people who have not confessed Jesus as their Lord are not just dying physically, as we all are, but that they are already spiritually dead. However, that doesn't necessarily make the matter any easier to understand. What does it even mean to be spiritually dead? Well, it doesn't seem like it can mean the same thing as being physically dead, because even those that are spiritually dead are alive and making choices, both good and bad, as we are. A person who is spiritually dead is living a life separated from God, and that tragic state originated from the original sin, that is, Adam and Eve eating from the tree that God forbade them to eat from. Like God told Adam, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. The moment that Adam and Eve ate from that tree, they broke God's law, and they began to die, because, and they were no longer able to live eternally. Their relationship with God was shattered. Instead of loving God, they feared him. And sadly, this brokenness was passed down to us. Without God saving us, we too would be spiritually dead. We would be doomed to die and not live eternally. We would face destruction. And also, without, bringing, without God bringing our spirits back to life, we would naturally set our minds on anything but God. Like it says in Romans 8, 6, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. But like we said, we can only be brought to life in one way, through the cross. It might not make sense to those who have not been saved, but who have not been changed by God, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But note something else in what Paul, in what Paul said. It does not just seem to be just a one-time occurrence. Now, God does give us eternal life and save us from death, but when, you, when God saved us, he started a process in us. Like we are told, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. However, the unsaved are dying even as they are dead. Indeed, in God's original command to Adam, the exact words that we heard were, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But a more precise translation would be, for the day that you eat of it, dying you shall die. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they did not immediately physically drop dead, but they did start dying. However, they did die spiritually the moment, the very moment they ate that forbidden fruit. But, and this is the important part, they did not spiritually die without a possibility of being reborn. Indeed, God himself provided protection for them and told them of a time coming when the serpent that deceived them would perish. But that means, but the means through which God would save us, would, would save his people, would not make sense to most, especially to those who the world would consider the best and brightest among us. Paul showed us this by quoting the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. He said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. I think it is hard for us to overestimate just how world-changing what Paul wrote, not just for the ancient world, but for ours too. You see, normally, if we want a problem solved, we go to the wise and the discerning. But Paul reveals that God himself is going to bring an end to all of that. But what does that mean? What was Paul trying to teach us? Now, previously I spoke about how people being spiritually dead means that they are separated from God and face destruction. But it goes deeper than that because the minds of the unsaved are deeply affected by being spiritually dead. If someone's mind is not made new and continually guided by Jesus, 
that it will inevitably be set on the way that the people do things in this world. And those ways are not God's ways. The ways of this world look good and right to the people in this world, but they are against God. As we're told, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, get ready for a little deep thinking here, but Martin Luther called this conflict between God's way and humanity's way the theology of the cross versus the theology of glory. And he wrote about it in his Hegelberg Disputation. There, in part, he wrote, that person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things that actually have happened. He deserved to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Now I'll give you, that might be a bit hard to understand, given that Martin Luther wrote it in his typically, well, deep style. But what it seems to mean is this. A theologian of glory looks for God's ways to be like their ways. And to virtually all people, the cross is a terrible thing used by terrible people for a terrible purpose. A theologian of glory might look at Jesus on the cross as a victim, convicted by a corrupt system to keep the powerful in the control. So they might see the cross as a symbol of oppression. Well, conversely, other theologians of glory might see Jesus on the cross as weak. And if he wasn't strong enough to save himself from his enemies, how could he save us from our enemies? To them, they might see the cross as a symbol of shame. However, those understandings don't take God's revelation into account. Yes, the cross looks like the strong oppressing the weak and a man being publicly shamed, but to a theology of glory, they can see with the cross for what it truly is. The cross was not where Jesus was oppressed, but where Jesus voluntarily freed us from oppression. By dying on the cross, Jesus gave us freedom. And the cross, as we are told, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the cross was not where Jesus was shamed, but where he was glorified, like Jesus told his disciples on the night before he would be crucified. Now the Son of Man, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Now, to most, the cross looks evil. But to us who are saved, it is salvation, or it is hidden or invisible, like Martin Luther said. To those who have not had their spirits brought to life, it, to those who do not have their spirits brought to life, but it doesn't have to remain hidden because the salvation that the cross brings is there for them all who accept it through the means that God himself has provided, which is faith, or as Paul puts it, for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. You see, we can't seek God through our own wisdom because our wisdom is not capable of finding God alone. We can't study the ways of the world and come to God. God must draw us to Him. We must have God's wisdom. And God's wisdom isn't merely humanity's wisdom, greatly or even infinitely expanded. It is wholly different. Belief in God is what it takes to find God. But of course, it must be a belief based on what God has said. Our faith might look like nonsense to others, but that is God's way. When people try to find God through their own understanding, they will inevitably find a God of their own making, and it's going to be a God that glorifies them in their ways. So you might say they will find a God that is like them, only bigger. If a person believes that 
happiness or comfort or justice are the ultimate goals in life, then if less to themselves, they are going to work, find a God that will worship and encourage them and maybe even provide things like happiness and comfort and justice. But note how all of those things are about the here and now. Those are the things of the theology of glory. Now, none of those things are bad. Indeed, most of those things are quite godly. But if we seek after God, primarily to see things like that done in our sight, we will miss the purpose for which Jesus came, and that is to save sinners. Jesus' primary purpose in coming up to us was to die on the cross so he could save us. But the cross looks like anything but happiness or comfort or justice. And yet, when we see our purpose with the cross in mind, everything changes. Surely we all want to be happy, but maybe our happiness is going to look much different from the rest of the world. We will see blessings in being poor in spirit, mournful, meek, and hungry, because we know that true happiness, you might say true joy, is coming to us. And we might want to be comforted too, but maybe our comfort is going to come from knowing that we are perfectly safe in Jesus' hand. And we want to see justice done just as much as everybody else. And while we know that justice will often and hopefully be done while well, before we depart to be with Jesus, we also know that we don't have to go to any length necessary to see justice done now because we know that one day God will have vengeance. And something else that separates the saved from the unsaved is how we seek God. Like Paul said, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. What he seems to have in mind is that some people seek for personally experienced and stunningly obvious miracles as proof of God's will or even his existence. I have listened to numerous debates between Christians and atheists. And when asked, when, asked the, for, when, when asked what proof the atheist would need to believe in God, the responses I hear are usually one of two main kinds. They either say they just can't think of any evidence that would prove God's existence, or more commonly they say they need to have some sort of undeniable sign, like seeing their name written in the stars and the heavens, along with a personal message from God telling them to believe in him. But this sign-seeking is illogical for a few reasons. One, it is asking for an unreasonable amount of evidence. And two, there is already more than enough evidence for people to reasonably believe in God's existence, such things as the moral argument. And third, and maybe most notably, demanding such sign would seem to imply that God is the winner if the atheist chooses to believe in him, when it is clearly the other way around. When a person is saved, they get eternal life. But God, well, they get another sinner, something that was already his in the first place. And there's more to Paul's point, and that is the Jews in Jesus' day seemed to be demanding a sign that God had wanted them to obey Jesus that were like the other signs that had been seen throughout their history. Like when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and everybody there heard and saw thunder and lightning and fire and smoke. But the Jews already had a sign. Indeed, they had many. Jesus performed an astounding number of miracles and taught so wisely that no one could ever prove him wrong. And the Jews also had the scriptures, which Jesus told them witnessed about him. And also, just as it was with the atheists, it seems like the Jews thought that God somehow owed them a sign, which is the opposite of the way it really was. The Jews owed God everything. God owed them nothing. Jesus was also a stumbling block to the Jews because they thought that their Messiah was going to be a conquering king that would overthrow Rome and bring Israel back to our former days of glory and power. They just could not comprehend that the Messiah was going to die on the cross, which was something they thought was reserved for murderers and thieves and the accursed. Even the disciples had troubles with this. They thought Jesus was going to be a mighty warrior, and that even after Jesus came back from the dead. Because to the arisen Jesus, the disciples asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
Now, the Messiah is indeed going to one day totally eradicate all the evil in the world, but that isn't going to happen to the day that Jesus comes back one final time. The first time the Messiah was to come, he was to suffer, not conquer. The Jews could not, the Jews could have known that had they but carefully studied their scriptures, and that at the leading of God. Like it says in Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. When we think about God this way, as theologians of the cross, it reminds us that we have to reject most of what the world tells us to do, which is usually to rely on our hearts and minds. Instead, we have to rely on God first, and then, and only then, can we turn to our renewed hearts and minds and be guided by Jesus. However, this doesn't mean that logic and signs have no place in teaching other people about salvation through Jesus and the cross. Far from it. Because there are any number of ways we can show people how God's ways makes the most sense out of the world as we know it. And likewise, there are many convincing proofs about God, Jesus, salvation, and the Holy Bible. However, entering into a loving and restored relationship with Jesus is not dependent upon them. Anyone can be saved, even a young child, because all it takes to be saved is faith in our Savior. So, will we look foolish to some because we believe in what they consider to be fairy tales? Yes, sometimes we're going to look foolish. Will we look weak by admitting that we know we don't have enough strength in ourselves to make it through life on our own? Yes, sometimes we are going to look weak. But like Paul said, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so, my beloved, I leave you with this. Trust in God alone. Now, the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And please rise for our offertory.
Please stand for the prayers of the church, and during our moment of silence, feel free to pray your prayers out loud or say them in your heart. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For pardon, that the Lord would set aside his indictment against our sin and forgive us for Jesus' sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the wisdom of God, that we would not confess the wisdom of men, but boldly proclaim Christ and him crucified for the salvation of the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For meekness, that we would be delivered from stubborn hearts and gladly submit to God's will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For parents, that the Lord who gave his firstborn for our sin would strengthen them to teach their children his ways and to rejoice his grace rather than embrace the sins of their forefathers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For peace, that the Lord who led his people past Pharaoh and Balak would promise wise rulers to the nations and protect us from tyranny. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the reviled and slandered on account of Jesus, the Lord would preserve them and ceaselessly give them joy and gladness that their reward in heaven is great. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For help and affliction, that the Lord who chooses what is weak in the world to shame the strong would use infirmities for our good until he delivers those who suffer from them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord God, we give thanks for Cece, who is doing much better. And we thank you, Jesus, for that and help her to be perfectly healthy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we continue to lift up Mona K to you, who is lost and confused. Jesus, we pray that you break whatever that is that she is going through. And we pray that you put Christians in her path who have been where she has been, but have gotten out of it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for niece Donna, who passed away. Oh, Jesus, we pray for that. We pray that she is now with you. We pray for her family members that are mourning her loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also pray for Deborah, who had a heart attack. Jesus, we pray for a recovery from that, if that is possible. We pray for wisdom for her to deal with her life after having a heart attack and wisdom for the doctors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for thanksgiving for baby Lucy who was born on Saturday. Amen, Jesus. We thank you for that little baby. We pray for the mom and the dad and that whole family that they will be able to adjust to this new baby. We pray that you give those parents at least a little bit of sleep. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for a healing for surgery for Sue. Indeed, Jesus, we pray for a swift recovery and no complications and wisdom for Sue. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. We pray for thanks for the birth of granddaughter for Eleanor nine years ago. In Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessing of children. And we pray that Eleanor walks with you now and for every day for the rest of her life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for Douglas's PET scan tomorrow. We pray that you keep Douglas calm and safe during that PET scan and wisdom for the doctors to find any problems if they exist. But of course, we pray for no problems whatsoever, Jesus. And we pray for peace in the meantime. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayers. And Jesus, we continue to lift up the Ukraine to you. We pray for an end to that war and protection from innocence. Uh, Jesus, just help the people that are going through that war be strong and anyone that is sacrificing anything for that to be provided for. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord God, Heavenly Father, receive our thanks for hearing all the requests that we have made to you this morning and in all other times. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we turn now to the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We, you may be seated, and we will sing our final hymn.
Actually, it makes me stand it. This is lift high the cross. So if you want to stand for this one, we can stand high. make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Well, thank you for coming here. We hope there's cookies there in the back. I'm almost positive, but there's definitely Christian fellowship. So have a good, blessed rest of the week. We hope to hear you next Sunday.